the MLBPA is suing major sports betting providers, and Georgia is going to allow college athletes to be paid directly. Plus, we're speaking with a player on one of the NFL's most surprising teams and one of tennis's rising stars. It's Wednesday, September 18th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we're looking into why the MLB Players Association is suing DraftKings, FanDuel, and other major sports betting companies with writer Jeff Benson. We're also speaking with two star athletes in very different sports, the Saints' Demario Davis and tennis player Ben Shelton. And Georgia is beginning the era of paying college players directly. First, let's hit some headlines. CBS's Sunday afternoon game between the Bengals and the Chiefs drew the network's largest audience for a September football game since 1998, with nearly 28 million viewers. The game was also the most watched television broadcast on any network since the Super Bowl earlier this year. It had a higher viewership than all but four primetime telecasts in all of 2023, all of which were NFL playoff games. Jordan Childs is still fighting to regain her bronze medal from the Paris Olympics. Childs' attorneys have filed a formal appeal with the Swiss Federal Tribunal to overturn the ruling that stripped Childs of her bronze medal in the first place. The U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee filed a letter in support of the appeal. This is likely the final appeal Childs can make in this case. The Florida Panthers have agreed to stay in Broward County until at least 2033. The reigning Stanley Cup champions exceeded over 1 million attendees for games last season for the first time in team history and ranked ninth in the NHL overall. The Panthers will pay Broward County $51.5 million up front for debt service and arena needs, and Broward County will pay the Panthers $25 million each year, primarily for capital expenditures, repairs, operations, and maintenance of their arena. MLS's newest team, San Diego FC, has announced Mikey Varas as its first head coach. Varas most notably was the interim head coach for the U.S. men's national team between Greg Berhalter and Mauricio Pochettino. San Diego FC's inaugural season kicks off in February. The MLB Players Union sued DraftKings and FanDuel, among others, on Monday over the use of players' name, image, and likeness across their platforms without permission. A statement from the Players Union said, The ability to control the commercial use of their names, images, and likenesses is a crucial return on professional athletes' substantial career investment. We'll have more on what to expect from this lawsuit up next with Front Office Sports contributor Jeff Benson. I'm joined now by freelance writer Jeff Benson. Welcome, Jeff. Hi, Owen. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on. So you have a story up on our site, frontofficesports.com, that about the MLB Players Association is suing DraftKings, FanDuel, Bet365, and Underdog Fantasy over NIL issues. What's the core of the MLBPA's claim here? Right. So MLB Players Incorporation, which is the for-profit subsidiary of the union, uh, it handles all the licensing deals for the players. And it's suing in two separate lawsuits, uh, DraftKings, uh, I think it's DraftKings and Bet365 in one, FanDuel and Underdog Fantasy in the other. And it's saying essentially, hey, you guys are using players' images when you don't need to be. Um, Essentially, when you go on any of these sites, and if you want to make a prop bet, you can see, you know, Bryce Harper, you can see Shohei Otani. Uh, And the Players Association through Players Inc. is saying, you don't need to do that. And in fact, you don't have the rights to do that, according to uh, our agreement. They've got, I don't know if we can call this proof exactly, but good evidence that they don't need it. uh, Because these same sites, they offer the same sorts of bets on NFL, NBA players, and they don't use those images, correct? Exactly. And in the in the complaint that's filed, there are screenshots showing, hey, here's what you're showing for Major League Baseball. Here's what you're showing for the NFL. And you can see quite clearly that you've got lots of player images that are made to make the betting a little bit more attractive. At least that's what the Players Association is claiming. And uh, in an interesting section, it essentially points to that. It says, hey, NFL is the most popular sport to bet on. You're not using this there. Um, Why are you doing that with our players? Yeah, that's interesting. And yeah, is the is a core question here. If a player's image is used just to like excite the the better, like you see a Shohei Otani and you're like, yeah, that guy destroys every baseball that comes in his way. I'm going to put a bet on him. Whereas if you just see the name, maybe you don't get that same visceral feeling. and is that the basic, um, is that the question here? 
I, I think that's part of the argument that, it, that yes, you're using this to kind of get people excited and want to bet on baseball in the first place, but also uh, the players association are, is arguing that there's some sort of implicit, implicit endorsement being made by the players because their images are appearing on this site. So they're asking for these companies to take the images down, correct? And perhaps, or if they want to, to use them to pay the MLBPA, though obviously that would be a, a separate thing that would not come out directly from the lawsuit. Um, are they asking for anything else? Yeah, they're asking for the judge to, to put, put a stop to this immediately, but they're also uh, asking for compensatory, punitive uh, damages, as well as disgorgement. They want those profits earned back. Now, the lawsuit itself, or the lawsuit against DraftKings, let's say, only makes mention of that these images and likenesses are valuable, but it doesn't put a monetary amount on those damages uh, beyond the hundreds of thousands. Okay, interesting. So it would be up to the court, I guess, to figure out what a, a baseball player's image is worth. They're asking for a jury trial. Um, uh -huh. So it would, be, it would be up to individual jurors to, to decide the, the damage range. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, you note in your story that the NFL PA also is suing DraftKings, uh, but it, and it's also over NIL stuff, but it's not, other than that, it's not really similar. It's over their NFT site, which doesn't exist anymore, like many NFTs. Um, is there any particular reason you see that all this stuff is you know, coming out sort of similar from a bird's eye view? These cases are coming out at the same time? Uh, honestly, I, I can't imagine why. I mean, MLB is coming to the end of its season, uh, although, you know, playoffs are probably when people start paying attention to, to Major League Baseball over the course of a 162 game season, uh, whereas NFL has, has just started. But I, I, I don't see much of a, of a link between the two. Anything in particular that you're watching out for as this case progresses? Right now, Major League Baseball and the Players Association, they're halfway through uh, a collective bargaining agreement that began before the 2022 season. In that agreement, there is th there's a clause dealing with uh, Major League betting promotions. Essentially, that collective bargaining agreement allowed players to... Uh, to make their own licensing deals uh, for promotional activities with sports betting companies. However, what, what the Players Association is saying here is that we have no such deal in place with these companies, and so they need to stop. So the question is moving forward, will such a deal happen and how much will that deal be worth? And you're reminding me that that the CBA that, you know, the last one caused a lockout, you know, we're Hopefully the next one will be more peaceful, but that the yep. <laughs> negotiations aren't that far away. Uh, Jeff Benson, really appreciate the insights. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Owen. A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bio age. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. The NCAA is still negotiating a settlement that will lead to college athletes getting paid directly, but Georgia is not waiting for that to happen. Governor Brian Kemp signed an executive order that prohibits the NCAA or college conferences from punishing schools that pay athletes directly or through NIL deals. The Virginia legislature did something similar earlier this summer. Like NIL before it, paying college athletes directly is likely to move quickly from state to state until there are rules that can be applied nationally. After all, at the moment, Georgia and Virginia schools have a recruiting advantage over other schools, and Kemp has established the precedent of doing this through an executive order, which does not involve convincing an entire legislature to take up the cause. In fact, other governors can basically copy Kemp's order, replace Georgia with their state name, and add their signature. 
If the NCAA wasn't in a rush to reach a settlement, they will be now. Speaking of paying college athletes, Tennessee has a simple plan to cover added costs connected to revenue sharing, raise ticket prices. The university is adding a 10% talent fee to all season and single game tickets starting next year. Tennessee Athletic Director Danny White told On3 that he thinks the total cost of revenue sharing will approach $30 million annually, and that this ticket charge will cover about a third of that. The school is unlikely to be the only one bumping up prices to cover the cost of paying athletes, so this is a branding move as much as anything. The calculation is that people will feel better about paying more if they know that the extra charge is going to the players. Michael Jordan has finally sold the mansion that was on the market for almost as many seasons as his NBA career. The 56,000 square foot property in Highland Park, a suburb north of Chicago, includes a basketball court, a tennis court, a putting green, a circular infinity pool, and a cigar room. It was listed for $29 million back in 2012, but has been at $14.9 million since 2015. Jordan bought the land in 1991, the year he won his first NBA championship, and moved there in 1994. His airness has been downsizing lately. Last year, he also sold a trio of luxury condos, which he had combined into one, on the 39th and 40th floors in a building along the lake in Chicago. Tua Tagovailoa has been placed on the injured reserve after suffering a concussion on Sunday. He will miss at least the next four games. There's been a lot of attention on whether Tagovailoa should even be playing football, and some amount of backlash on people weighing in on that very personal and consequential decision. This move gives him time to heal, and it also gives all of us some time to take a step back and give the guy some space. It's a dramatic and compelling story, so it makes sense that people are interested, but nothing here should be decided quickly or lightly. I expect we'll see Tua back on the field for Week 8, and I also expect this conversation isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Ben Shelton is one of the young players that is providing new hope for American men's tennis. He made it to the third round at the U.S. Open and is now headed to the Labor Cup in Berlin. Shelton spoke to our editor-in-chief Dan Roberts, and their chat is coming up. Okay, Dan Roberts here in the FOS studio in New York, and we've got tennis star Ben Shelton. Ben, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Dan. So we're about a week after an awesome U.S. Open. We had the final. We saw Sinner versus Fritz. All good there. But to me, the highlight, Shelton Tiafo. Let's just start there. Talk to me about that epic match. Yeah, it was a, it was a cool match to be a part of, uh, for sure. You know, a rematch from last year's U.S. Open uh, quarterfinal. So unfortunate that we had to meet so early because we were clearly both playing at a really high level. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I can't complain playing in an atmosphere like that on Ash. Uh, some of the things that you dream about. So uh, I, was, I, I was upset, obviously, that I didn't come out on top. But um, I'm grateful for another experience there at the U.S. Open. It's my favorite tournament. Yeah, it was so cool to watch, and I think big picture, if we zoom out, you know, I'm a little older than you. Um, I've lived through this era in which there really weren't big American stars. I mean, the last big one, there was Roddick, and he had the misfortune of being in the Nadal, Federer, Djokovic era. But now we're seeing, on the men's and women's side, a real proliferation of U.S. stars back advancing far into the tourney, you know, pick your example. Talk to me a little bit about that. I mean, obviously, for you, you're focused on you, on Ben Shelton, but you look around and U.S. stars are, are really back at the top of the ranks, which is exciting. Yeah, I think competition is great, and I think competition is what makes us better. As a country, for a while, it was the women holding the torch. Um, they always seemed to have a girl who was uh, winning a slam or getting to the Finals, uh, obviously we had Serena for all that time, and then we had Sloan who won a slam, and Maddie Keyes who's been in the finals, Jen Brady and uh, Sophia Cannon, now Coco is a Grand Slam champion. So the guys were kind of kind of slacking compared to the girls for a while. Um, but I think that that competition has really raised our level. We have a group of guys who are all friends, um, similar in age, and in the top 15, top 20 in the world. And so I think that when you get a, a group like that and create that kind of atmosphere, that's what breeds success. So I'm happy with where uh, U.S. tennis is, is heading and certainly excited to be a part of it. Before a big U.S. Open, we had Olympic tennis. Can we talk a little bit about your mindset there with opting out? Uh, what would it take for you to play at the Olympics next time? 
Yeah, I think there's a few things. Um, adding, it, it's only my second year on tour. It feels like I've been out there longer, but I'm still trying to figure things out. I'm playing tournaments for the first time that I've never never played before, so I'm just trying to get used to it. And uh, adding another um, surface change at, at that part of the season, so close to the U.S. Open and uh, going back to Europe again, um, I was just, I was honestly too tired, too exhausted to do it. And I think that it's important that you put together a schedule where you don't get injured and you're able to maintain your level throughout the year. And I think if I played the Olympics, that just wasn't possible for me um, this year. And uh, in terms of what it would take to play, I think LA 2028 is much more enticing because it is in the U.S. It's on the same surface as the U.S. Open. And uh, that'd be one that I'd really look forward to um, if, if, if I were to make it. I think Brisbane in 2032 is a little different story <laughs> going to the other half of the world, but we'll see. Yeah, that's some big travel. Uh, that's smart. Makes sense. Let's talk about what's up next on your schedule. We've got the Labor Cup coming up in Berlin. Really cool event. Uh, been around a few years now. You know, we had the chance to talk to Roger Federer's agent, Tony Godsick, about it. You know, Federer is going to be there more as an ambassador, second year of Federer not playing. But they got a lot of top players who are coming out, including you. Uh, talk to me about how you think about something like the Labor Cup, obviously different from a major. Yeah, I think uh, it's an important event. It's, it's a big event, and you see how many guys in the top 10, top 15 are playing. Um, they care about this. And I think it's a, a great event for tennis. You get to see the guys in a team-like atmosphere um, for one time out of, out of the whole year where we're only thinking about ourselves, playing for ourselves. You get to see the reactions of the guys on the bench um, in a little bit more relaxed setting, cheering for their guys, goofing off. Um, it's, it's something that I, I really enjoyed last year uh, being the first time that I played. So um, it's just one of those great weeks for me that I really enjoy and kind of reminds me why I love and, and enjoy this sport. I think playing for, for Johnny Mack is another uh, really cool thing that I've enjoyed. Uh, I think that he's a, he's a great guy, great tennis mind, and just such a personality. So it, it's sad that this is going to be his last year at the Labor Cup, but obviously we have Andre Agassi coming in, not too, not too shabby either. So uh, he'll be there in Berlin as well, kind of shadowing uh, Johnny Mack and, 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 and seeing how the whole Labor Cup process works. But yeah, I'm excited to hopefully compete on this team for years to come. For an event like that, does it feel a lot lower pressure and does that make it more fun to play? Um, I think knowing that you can rely on your teammates and obviously you want to win every match you play very badly but at the end of the day the team can still get the job done even if you take a loss uh, I think I, I enjoy that part of of the format obviously whenever you're in a ATP tournament and, and you lose a match you're out that's it done um, so I think it takes a little bit of pressure off knowing that you could rely on your teammates sometimes to, to get to to get the job done. I mentioned Roger Federer who co-created the Labor Cup and obviously uh, he was with Nike for so long, had that iconic RF logo and then, and I remember covering it very closely as a sports business guy, uh, moved over to Uniqlo and then was able to add his deal with On. You're repping your, your On brand, you got the hoodie on. Talk to me a little bit about that part of your identity, the On deal, you know, repping it on the court but also where could that go in terms of off the court? Yeah, I think it was a it was a really interesting opportunity for me because you have a lot of big companies. Um, not throwing any shade, but you you go to the U.S. Open and you see uh, the guys in Nike, and there's 20 guys wearing the same thing, or Adidas, 20 guys wearing the same thing. On at first it was just me. Now it's two guys wearing the same thing. So. Um, the ability to kind of grow with the company, I think, was really cool. I was the first uh, tennis player, that active tennis player that they signed. Obviously, they had they had Roger with the shoe, and I guess I was the first head to toe um, tennis player. So, it's uh, it's really special for me, and it's been great to work with those guys. I don't think many people who 
work with clothing companies, uh, get as much access as On has given me, um, just being able to interact with the higher ups in the company, the founders, the, the CEO, I've just had so many cool opportunities. And uh, in terms of off, all, all the On collaborations they've done in the higher fashion and, and streetwear world, uh, that's the type of stuff that really excites me, you know, the collaboration with Loewe, um, I'm wearing that stuff all the time, and I, I just think that it's a very versatile brand and, and something that uh, I like to be a part of. Yeah, I know, I've been really impressed with how the company, which was known first for running, has really succeeded in, in going into tennis, too. Talk to me a little bit about any other business interests or long-term endeavors. You know, you've got to be pretty focused on tennis here, and you've still got a lot of great years in tennis. But, you know, more and more athletes are obviously thinking about their off-the-court, off-the-field business ventures, portfolios. What are you eyeing? What are you into in terms of uh, your off-the-court brand approach and business ambitions? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I, I think that it's something that evolves for me you know uh, with all I've been able to do in my life so far it's hard to believe that I'm only 21 but um, I know that I have a lot of time to think about those type of things obviously uh, first and foremost it's m most important to have the right advisors around you which I have you talked about Tony Godsick uh, uh, Roger Federer's agent and at the at the same company Alessandro Santalbano who's my, or, or they're both my agents, but Alessandro is the one that I work with every single day. And those guys are, have done a great job with growing my brand and giving me business opportunities here and there and opening doors for me that wouldn't have been there otherwise. So that, those type of things will continue to, to evolve. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not just somebody who only focuses on tennis. I like the business world. I like the finance world. And... Uh, but but the things that I like and dislike are still are still changing. So I think that um, I'm not someone to rush into those type of things, but there's, there's definitely some things that interest me. What do you think uh, Ben Shelton's brand is? I think that my brand isn't just one thing. Um, I, I think for me, my on-court brand and off-court brand are two different things. I think on court I can be a fearless competitor. Um, I'm not scared of anybody or, or any moment. I just love to go out there and compete and uh, I'm going to try to be a dog while I'm doing it. Um, I'm, not, I'm not out there to try to be friendly or win people over or make people like me. Um, I'm out there to, to compete and I think that a lot of the things that I do on the court are also entertaining because I love having fun while doing it. Um, I think my demeanor off the court is much different than my demeanor on the court. I think uh, kind of that uh, wired, uh, loud competitor that's on the court is I'm, I'm a bit more mellow off the court. I'm, I'm always smiling. I like, I like talking to people, hanging around, you know, cracking jokes. That's just kind of how I am. So I think that I can uh, be that classy, respectful guy who's not as, not as loud or, or, I'm not a loud or obnoxious guy off the court, but I think that when I get on the court, I'm, I'm able to flip the switch and, and do the things that help me compete the best. Well, I got two more questions for you, tennis specific. So we talked about McEnroe and Agassi coming in with the Labor Cup. Talk to me a little bit just about coaching in tennis and you know, how you've worked with uh, the coaches on that side of things and, and if you think things are kind of changing and evolving in that way. Yeah, tennis is different these days because you can coach your player on the court. When, when you're sitting on the sidelines, you can give them signals, you can talk to them in between every point, uh, kind of help them through the process, which is different from the way things were in the past. And I think coaching is a, is a huge part uh, of tennis. Um, my dad's kind of been my sole coach my whole career, and we work really well together. That's just something that's always clicked between us. Um, but I think coaching is a very delicate job in tennis. It's tough because it's such a mental sport. 
Um, any little change in, in the mind can drastically uh, change performance on the court. So I think that really knowing your player and having that continuity of having a player-coach relationship that's uh, lasted a long, long time re really helps for tennis, especially for me. And, uh, yeah, getting coached by Johnny Mack has been a, a, a treat for me, you know, that one week out of the year last year and this year just to kind of see the way that he sees the game. Um, he's left-handed, uh, just like me, and uh, he, he has such a passion for the sport, and especially the Labor Cup. His idol growing up was Rod Laver, so it's something that he doesn't take for granted, the spot that he has, and he puts all his effort into it. So a lot of respect for Johnny Mack. Yeah, and of course, even though they can be kind of close to you, talk to you, do some hand motions, can't go in and play for you. you know? That's <laughs> so, true. Yeah, you're out, there. So you're out there on your own. Right, right. Uh, and then lastly, you know, as a tennis fan and viewer, I'm almost still thinking about that moment in Cincy maybe a month ago with that crazy call. And you can rewatch the clip endless times and still come up with different opinions. A, a match point hinged on it. But it kind of prompted a new conversation around video review and replay and um, using Hawkeye and, and what should be done, what shouldn't be done when we talk about officiating and, and hard to tell live bounces like that. Do you have a take on what happened there? I think the video review, 100%, uh, they should have it at every tournament. It's just, there's too much at stake. We're, we're a too advanced sport. Um, we have a Hawkeye, Hawkeye Live system that can call every single bounce on the court, every shot, but we can't review whether a guy hit the ball down off of his racket into the ground or uh, up and over. You know, I have my own thoughts about what should have happened in that moment, but that's <laughs> beside the fact um, that it, we should do a better job and have that, uh, what do they say, VAR at, at every tournament. And that's something that I think that they're working on and that, that needs to be worked on because, uh, like I said, there's, there's too much at stake. I think we'll see a lot of technological changes come to the sport in the next 10, 15 years. The other interesting thing at, uh, about Cincinnati was their Hawkeye system was actually malfunctioning a lot throughout the week. So that makes you almost also kind of question the, the, the line calling system of if it's correct every time or if it's making a lot of mistakes. Yeah, and I think you can never fully get rid of humans either. Right. And, and shouldn't. Um, we talked about US Open, we talked about Labor Cup. Let's end on this. Your favorite tournament, major or not, to play? Okay, uh, for major, I'm going to go U.S. Open. Nothing like it. I'd say Wimbledon is a close second, but uh, something about the U.S. Open, especially being American, is just a little bit different for me. Um, for non-Grand Slams, I would probably go with Tokyo. Uh, my first tournament that, that I won out here on tour, and uh, yeah, a, a really cool event. It was one of my favorite cities that I've been to, and uh, I'm excited. That'll be the first tournament that I play after the Labor Cup, so looking forward, a lot to look forward to in the next couple of weeks. Ben, thanks for talking to us. Thanks for having me, Dan. Demario Davis has been a consistent force on the New Orleans Saints defense for years. He took some time on his off day to discuss the new rules this season, the NFL's approach to making the game safer, what it's like to play overseas, and the work he's doing in New Orleans. I really enjoyed chatting with him, and that's coming up next. I'm joined now by New Orleans Saints linebacker Demario Davis. Welcome, Demario. Hey, what's going on, big guy? How you doing? Hey, great, great. How you doing? Uh, blessed. All right, yeah. So we're, you know, we're only two games in, but how are you feeling about the season so far? Uh, anytime you can start off uh, two and zero, uh, it feels great because um, there's a lot of other ways that you can start. And so, um, you know, at the beginning of the season, it's about trying to get. Uh, it's a race to get better, and so you're just trying to beat everybody in, in the race to get better. And uh, you know, we certainly have started off strong um, and put ourselves in, in favorable position. Um, but this is where, you know, the, the season is, you know, ready to pick up. Every team is going to be getting better at this point. Um, you've put in a lot, of, you put a lot of tape out there. Uh, and so people are going to have a good beat on who you are in this season. 
And um, so, you know, it's uh, it's a good start, but we, we still got a lot of work to do. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I think, you know, some the sidelines don't always appreciate how much adjustments happen in season. Um, you've played the Panthers and the Cowboys. Uh, they've got a Super Bowl, you know, hopeful contending team there and a rebuilding team, let's say. Do you feel the difference in intensity once you're on the field? It's the NFL. Every game is tough. Each game presents its own challenges. Um, you are going against guys who uh, oftentimes are getting paid a lot to do what they do. Um, and there's a reason why that's the case. And so each team prevent, presents its own challenges. And, uh, you know, coming off of a uh, game against the Cowboys, which is a really, really good team, uh, perennial playoff team, um, they are right there. They got all the right pieces. Um, it was a, it was a difficult task to go on the road and win, and we found a way to do that. And so uh, it's good. In the first two weeks, we played good football at home and on the road, so we know we can do it. Uh, now it's going to be about consistency and what it takes. And uh, now we have a really big challenge in Philly, a really good Philadelphia team coming in at home. We're going to have to be ready. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've, of course, you have some new rules this year. I'm curious your thoughts there. Let's start with the new kickoff system. Um, are you enjoying it? It's stressful? What, what are your thoughts there? Uh, it's different. It's different. Um, and I think, you know, uh, in this league, you got to be able to adjust to, to different. Every year it's going to be something. Um, and so this year is to kick off and I think guys are really adapting to it. Um, you see a lot of, uh, guys in my position, making a lot of plays linebackers, uh, especially useful. I feel like it, it plays to their advantage. Um, you know, I think the returners to, to really make an explosive play, you're getting a lot more kick return, but, uh, for them to really break one, they're going to have to probably break a few tackles, uh, because it's much more like, a a, a run play versus either a, like a true kick return. So uh, it's been interesting. It's been interesting. Possibly uh, something that affects you even more is the ban of the hip drop tackle. Do you, do you like that new ruler? And um, yeah, just any, any thoughts on kind of adjusting to this, this new way you have to take players down? Yeah. I mean, I, I understand the need for it. I um, understand um, why it's been introduced. Um, it's not, it's not a top, a type of tackling style that I've, uh, ever really used, and so it doesn't really affect affect the way I play. Any thoughts on you know we had a couple offensive players uh, making some noise this past weekend over not getting those calls. You know, right? Joe Mixon took to social media. Jamar Chase got an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty for complaining to the refs about it. Uh, do you feel like the you know everyone's? Did you, did you, is there an adjustment period for the refs with this as well? Uh, possibly, I, I I just wouldn't know. Um, I understand the rule. I understand why it's in the game. Um, I can understand from an offensive person, you know, wanting to protect themselves. Um, I can understand from a safety standpoint why, why it's included in the game. I just have never really noticed it, you know, in real time. Um, I think guys are just trying to get guys down to the ground. Um, I do understand that if you pull yourself and slingshot yourself through and throw your weight on somebody's back legs, how dangerous that is. And certainly, like I said, it's not a tackle that I've ever used. Um, I didn't see those plays in particular, and uh, what the what the you know uh, uproar was about. So I can't really speak to those. Um, but yeah, I understand it's reasoning in the game, but it doesn't affect the way I play. So the NFL, it kind of has this like back and forth of trying to keep it an exciting, engaging game, obviously, but also make sure it's safe and that the players are safe, that people want to play this game going forward, um, given the you know the potential for for danger. Um, we saw that with the kickoff where first they semi eliminated the return by just, it seemed like everything was a touchback for a while. Now we've got this new system that tries to have returns and have them be safe. Um, you know, similar with the hip job tackle. Do you think the league's going about it the right way in terms of how it tries to find that balance? I certainly think so. I think it's a tough task, right? It's, um, to think about all the different dynamics in a game that's by nature, a violent game. Uh, to figure out where you can make the game safer, um, to preserve the longevity of players, to pros preserve the longevity of the game. I mean, it's it's arguably the greatest um, sport sporting contest uh, in the world. Um, certainly uh, one of one of the largest, and um, to be a part of something that that special, uh, you want to see it preserved, you want to see it protected, and I think that's what. 
uh, the league has been tasked with doing um, on all levels, whether it's, it's the executives, whether it's uh, the players association, uh, whether it's uh, coaches, managers, uh, players alike. And I think everyone wants to, 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 to make this game uh, better. And I think that's what, what it's about. It's, it's a phenomenal game. It's extending nationwide. We have it. Uh, flag football is coming to the Olympics. So it's a game of football. It's just it's such a great teacher of life. And um, it's it has such an impact on our society. You, you feel uh, the chills and the goosebumps and the pit of your stomach every time football season rolls back around. We're right back in it. And so I think to understand where this game has come from and where it is in our world now and where it can still go, I think they're doing a great job uh, on all levels to, to, to preserve and protect the game. You know, just as football as a teacher, you just mentioned, what's the biggest lesson you think you've gotten from playing? I think that you just can't, you can't accomplish anything uh, meaningful alone. Um, you have to have uh, good people beside you. Uh, you have to have other people who are stronger than you in spaces that, that you can't do. I think football is the ultimate team game. And the only way that you're, 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 uh, that you will have real success is for your team to have uh, success and, uh, that takes everybody, you know, working with one another and uh, leaning on uh, other people in the area of their strengths. And so uh, it just shows you uh, what can happen when you have when you have teamwork and that real success can only happen when you have a good teamwork. I think that's what I've learned more than anything. You mentioned growing the game. I know you played in, in London a couple of years ago, which has become a regular stop for the NFL. So we're seeing games in new countries almost every year now. Um, what was that experience like playing overseas? Oh, it's amazing. Um, you know, just to get a chance to do your job and uh, get to experience other cultures, other environments, um, you know, to see their their understanding of the game and love for the game. Um, when uh, you're able to be around people who grew up totally different than you, have totally different culture norms, and to be able to blend those around something that's common. Um, something that you do every day um it's it, it's special and uh you know to be a part of a game that that provides those type of opportunities is special um and to see and know kind of where the game is going um and how much that's going to increase and i think being able to bring something that we joy joy in our country uh to the to the highest power um or at the utmost in the utmost way to be able to sh share that and spread that around the world is it's amazing you know kind of being a champion and ambassador for that so you just had your 100th consecutive start which is a huge achievement in itself uh, Thank you. against the cowboys last weekend in honor of that uh you and your family are replacing a hundred percent of the beds at covenant house a homeless shelter that serves youth from 16 to 22 in new orleans uh, tell me about this. This is great. Yeah, I mean, uh, firstly, this, this this is an amazing partnership with Ashley. Uh, they do so much in our community. Uh, they really care about uh, the New Orleanians and, and, and the sur surrounding areas. And um, it's, it's amazing to see how they're stepping up in the community. Uh, our foundation, the Devoted Dreamers, has had, and our family have had a longstanding partnership with the Covenant House or worked with the Covenant House around holidays and I just do a, an amazing, uh, you know, work for for, for uh, uh, that age group of 16 to 22 uh, year olds, and um, you, you just think about being in a homeless shelter, how much a bed means, and so, um, you know, they're coming in and, and, and replacing Ashley's coming in and replacing uh, the bed, the beds uh, of 100 percent of that that uh, shelter, and it's just amazing to be a part of the work that they're doing in the community. Um, this is a part of a much larger partnership that we have with Ashley and doing some more stuff in the community. So really excited for, uh, what we and Ashley kind of have, uh, kind of coming down the pipeline and really excited about, uh, those beds being replaced and uh, a little bit later in the season. And, uh, we're going to be able to go over there and be a part of that. Um, you know, Ash Ashley's just a, a phenomenal community champion. Um, this is upwards of $30,000, uh, worth of furniture uh, that they're going to be uh, supplying to the Covenant House. And so i um, just excited to be uh, alongside them for this. And actually, we were supposed to have this conversation last week. Um, that 
we ended up postponing because of the the tropical storm in New Orleans. How's New Orleans doing right now? Doing doing much better. Doing much better. Um, oh man, I just got some exciting news. One of my guys just made a team, man. Hey, shout out to my dog. He know who he is. Hey, come on, man. Hey, whatever it takes. But uh, so that was big. That's why I just put a big smile on my face. I saw that he just sent me a text. But uh. Yeah, man, our city, man, uh, it, it, it wasn't as bad as some of the other ones uh, that we faced. And so uh, this, is a, this, is, this is an extremely resilient community. Um, um, so the way that the city kind of comes together and pulls through uh, these times, uh, it, it certainly knocked out a lot of power and uh, a lot of people had uh, different types of issues. And so, of course, our hearts and prayers are constantly with, with those individuals and, and, and those families and uh you know, but this is this is a part of living in New Orleans. You know, every every so often, and so uh, you just kind of you know brace through it. But we we made it through, um, and it wasn't as bad as it could have been. So you know, praise God for that, and uh, uh, we're recovering and moving forward. All right, very cool. Thanks for the work you're doing in your community, and good luck on the season, Demario Davis. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. All right, thank you, man. Be blessed. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we take a look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. The Champions League introduced a new format that is increasing the amount of games teams will have to play, and players are not happy about it. Manchester City's Rodri went as far as to say that players are close to going on strike because of the increase in fixtures. Ahead of the club's match against Inter Milan, Rodri said, You can play 40, 50 games at a top level, but not 60 to 70. This year we are going to play 70, maybe 80 games. In my humble opinion, I think it's too much. I think we have to take care of ourselves. Someone has to take care of ourselves because we are the main characters of the sport. He later alluded that he's not the only player who feels this way, and that if the calendar isn't changed soon, then players will have no choice but to go on strike. For our soccer fans, let me know what you think UEFA should do here. Send us an email at today at frontofficesports.com. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, please share it with a friend and make sure you're subscribed wherever you like to tune in. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.